So welcome back once again. It is time for more space awesomeness. What have you got for us this week? Today I figured I would talk about the different heat shield systems on various NASA spacecraft throughout the years. Cool. And also talk about all these various cats walking in front of the camera. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I think people are pretty familiar with the idea of a heat shield. Mm -hmm. I think people understand that, you know, as you come back from space, you're going very, very fast. You build up friction with the air and uh, you it, things get real hot and mm -hmm. you need to have something to protect you from that. Mm -hmm. I think people kind of picked up a lot of that from the movies, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. um, so real quick, I wanted to talk about the different strategies for handling this and why it gets hot in the first place. Okay. So it is true that you that the heat is generated by friction with the air, but not quite in the way that people think. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, you have this image of it kind of like the air is blasting along the surface of the capsule or the vehicle or whatever, and that rubbing of the air is what's making it hot. But what's actually happening is these vehicles are moving at such ridiculous speeds that the air kind of doesn't have enough time to like know about it coming. So mm. it just kind of gets smashed and builds up the shock wave of air that just can't get out of the way fast enough. It's, okay. too, it's too much. And so you end up building it. So if you had a nice pointy spaceship, uh, this shock wave would form right on the tip. And then the tip would be right in the shock wave, which uh, makes it very, very, very hot. Hmm. And you're not going to have a good time. And this is one of the interesting discoveries in the, the 50s and 60s when they're looking into uh, reentry was you don't want to be sharp and pointy and aerodynamic. You want to be as blunt as possible. Mm. So they, you know, totally counterintuitively started building these like big wide wedges. And, you know, <laughs> that's why like when the shuttle flies back, mm. you know, people have this image of it going nose first, like, no, it yeah. barely flies. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, but so you end up with a shock wave a couple inches away from the uh, skin of the vehicle and it's very, very, very hot. So how are you going to deal with that? Um, the mercury capsules, this is actually not at all a solved question when they started out. Uh, the question, the big two strategies were going to be ablative heat shield, which, spoiler, that one, or heat sink, uh, which I never really heard about until recently. So the idea with the heat sink was they would make the heat shield out of beryllium, and it would just get way crazy hot on the way in. And that was the plan. <laughs> like, wow. It would just get super, super crazy hot, and then by the time the reentry got done, You'd be this capsule with this like super crazy hot disc attached to the bottom of you, mm -hmm. and they would have to like figure out how to like either hang it underneath it or you know what's going to happen when it hits the water or like what if you land in the, what if you land in the forest and it starts a fire Oof. and your astronaut dies in a forest fire? What even <laughs> happened there? Glass uh, in the desert. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it worked sort of, but there were additional problems with like they weren't really sure how to handle keeping the heat away from you know. They're now super hot heat shield. How do you keep that heat out of the capsule? Mm -hmm. uh, and they never really finished working on it because at the same time, they're working on ablative heat shields, which turned out to be great. So ablative heat shields, uh, the whole idea with them is essentially burn away as you go. Uh, they ablate away. Uh, okay. And with each little piece of the heat shield that flies away on fire, you're taking a little bit of energy with it. Mm -hmm. um, these are what they eventually settled on for the orbital flights of Mercury. They use them through Gemini, Apollo, uh, all that stuff. And these are the ones that you're familiar with. <laughs> I keep bringing it up to it. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the movie Apollo 13, you know, mm -hmm. you've got those big fiery sequence with the pieces ch flying off. Yeah. That's an ablative heat shield. Gotcha. Uh, ablative heat shields are great because they're pretty simple. Uh, they take a lot of heat, but you can only use them once, which, you know, during the Apollo program was not that big of a deal. But later on, it becomes kind of a deal breaker. Uh, at the same time that, you know, the Mercury program and Gemini program and all that's going on, you've got the X-15 program, which a lot of people don't really think about as a space program, but hey, you know, two of those flights cross a 100 kilometer line and, you know, I call that a space flight. Definitely. Uh, so you have this basically a pointy airplane that is kind of the precursor to the space shuttle and it was going to be going up to like Mach 6 or so, you know, they, you know, they, they, at that point they understood pretty well Mach 2 or 3, you know, like, well, someday we want to fly something into space, that's going to be like Mach 25, <laughs> so we got to get closer, uh, and the strategy with the X-15 was, again, a heat sink, but instead of, uh, like, one specific area covered in beryllium, they kind of made the entire plane a heat sink, they called it a hot structure, so the entire exterior of the plane was made of ink canal, which, interestingly enough, SpaceX now uses for their Super Draco thrusters. Oh. Um, and the interior was still like titanium and aluminum, 
but the outside would just get super crazy hot. <laughs> like it'd be like 1200 degrees outside. They said that the plane would grow, glow cherry red when it was at its peak heats, which I have to imagine was pretty disconcerting to the pilot. Wow. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, another heat sink strategy. Uh, and they could get away with that. Uh, same as with the early Mercury flights, because it was so short, you know, they didn't have to really worry too much about, okay, you know, it's not like the shuttle re-entries where you're in there for 20, 25 minutes. Mm-hmm. You're kind of at peak heating for a couple minutes, and then you can get the rest of the flight down to cool off. Gotcha. Um, and, and, and was that kind of the, the, the solution, if you will, that, you know, once they, uh, you know, kind of got into atmosphere decently, they could kind of fly a little bit, cool it off, and then land? Yeah, so I mean, the whole X-15 flights, you know, it had a rocket stuck in the back and not really a proper jet engine, so Mm -hmm. those flights didn't last very long once they got going. Mm -hmm. Uh, So they would, you know, fly along at these super crazy speeds, and eventually, you know, the air would slow them down pretty quick, and, you know, they get all hot, but by the time they slowed down, the vehicle had kind of cooled down enough that it wasn't really a problem. Uh, What's amazing to me about it was, you know, they had computational models and stuff, but no one was really sure, like, hey, if we get this thing way hot, in like air conditions no one's ever experienced Mm -hmm. is this thing going to be okay and these crazy pilots are like yeah sure no problem (laughs) (laughs) bravery or insanity you know (laughs) yeah yeah i was recently reading a book about the x-15 project that was Mm -hmm. written in like 1965 and they're listing all the pilots and just like in among everyone else like with no special mention is mr n a armstrong <laughs> wow. like, oh boy we're gonna be seeing more of you in a couple of years <laughs> wow that's amazing uh, but yeah so the ablative heat shields you can only you know so heat heat sinks you can use uh a bunch of times mm-hmm. but they can only use them for a short period of time mm-hmm. the ablative heat shields they work great but you can only use it once so then we introduced the space shuttle so you uh, got yeah. you know you want to have this vehicle you're gonna use lots and lots of times so they kind of went with a, not quite, but kind of an all of the above solution. Mm-hmm. Like if you ever look at a model of what kind of heat protection is on the space shuttle, there's just like six different types. You've got reinforced carbon carbon on the nose, uh, nose cone and the uh, leading edges of the wing. You've got thermal blankets all over the place. You've got these silica tiles on the bottom. You've got, um, and I used to have silica tiles all over the top as well. Mm-hmm. All these different various types of uh, thermal protection. and. To be honest, I, I tried to look this up just now. I know it's not ablative. Mm-hmm. I know it's not a heat sink. I believe the cooling mechanism is it insulates the vehicle from the heat. Oh, okay. It's just like, you know, there's so much empty space in those tiles, for instance, mm. that it just keeps it away from the structure. Because, you know, the shuttle underneath it all is just aluminum. Mm. So, you know, if they let it get a couple inches back, you know, you're not going to have a good mission. And are those different kinds of uh, insulation, for lack of a better term, um, is that partly because of the shape of the shuttle where you know, you've got wings, you've got a cone, or you know, a nose cone, all these different yeah. things that require different kinds of sort of uh, protection? Yeah, so you'd end up with totally different heating regions in, in this vehicle because it's such a strange shape compared to you know, something nice and simple like a ball or something. <laughs> uh, so as it came belly flopping through the atmosphere, the air would come rushing mostly, like, you know, the most intense part of it was over the leading edges of the wing mm-hmm. and the nose cone. Those got up to, I don't even remember, ridiculous mm-hmm. temperatures. Mm-hmm. So they made that out of the reinforced carbon carbon, which is this material that can handle super crazy heat, uh, heating, but it's um, kind of brittle. Uh, you know, it's strong mm-hmm. to a point, but then once it goes, it goes, uh, as, you know, we unfortunately learned on STS-107, the mm-hmm. Columbia mission. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas... Like, most of the bottom of the structure is made of these silica tiles, which can still, you know, I mean, <laughs> compared to the RCC, it's maybe not as much, but it still, like, can handle really crazy heat. And mm. it's such a good insulator. There are great videos you can look up online where they put it in a blast furnace, take it out, and it's glowing red, uh, and immediately the guy just grabs it by the edges because, you know, of course, the edges wow. first, but he's holding it, Ooh. and the rest of it is still glowing red. And it's just like, <laughs> that is incredible. Ooh. And it glows for a while, too, because it holds, it just, you know, mm. it just holds on to this. It does not want to change its temperature. <laughs> and, you know, pretty soon it just gets nice and cool again. Wow, amazing. Now, did they ever have any issues with that um, in terms of reentry? I, I know I remember watching um, STS-135 come down, and yeah. like it landed, and they were like, we're not going in just yet. We need to wait a few minutes to, to go inside. Were there ever any issues in terms of how long it took to cool down? Oh, so when the shuttles landed, uh, there was a whole bunch of other issues related to that. Like, for instance, mm-hmm. the um, the APUs, the auxiliary power units, they would be running, and I, you know, basically like various noxious fumes would be coming out of the shuttle <laughs> at the time. So, like, if you ever saw the, like the thermal imaging at it landing, you see this like plume coming out of the top. Wow. Uh, and I don't think it was any kind of heating issue because you okay. got to remember, like, with the shuttle reentry, peak heating happened well before peak deceleration, and then all mm-hmm. that was you know a little while before they glided back down. Like, it was mm-hmm. still. 
hot. Like, I, you know, mm. I'd be really interested to know if you could just walk up and touch it. Mm. Uh, but I don't think it was like, we got to stay back. This thing is too hot. It's more just like, you know, we've got, you know, they've got, for instance, uh, all these hypergolic fuels for the OMS pods, mm. uh, which they just fired to come back. And, you know, um, I forget exactly what they use for the uh, attitude control mm. thrusters. I think that's hypergolic fuels as well, which is, again, is like the nastiest substances on Earth. <laughs> so I think they've got to give the vehicle a minute to chill <laughs> and for the, br- the breeze right, to get rid of anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, that's just kind of amazing in and of itself when you think that something that was that hot, you know, not that long ago, you yeah. know, lands and, oh, okay, it's yeah. ready to go. Thousands of degrees and inside of it, you know, not only... Well, the one thing I always end up thinking about weirdly is not so much the seven people up front; it's the rubber tires on the in the belly. Yeah. Like, that always, How do those not melt? <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it's it's weird. Like you know, I, I heard this, this great talk about like how ridiculous these tires were. Like you know, like what a stressful job that is. You got to have these tires that got to la- survive a launch. They got to sit around in a vacuum in space for two weeks. Then you got one shot after coming through reentry oh. to nail it. And, you know, <laughs> they cost like fifty thousand dollars each. And mm-hmm. you know, someone asks like you know, in this documentary, they're asking like you know. If you can use them twelve times each, how come you you know replace them each time? Like, mm-hmm. And the tire engineer just deadpan is like, "Why would you risk a ten billion dollar spacecraft for a fifty thousand dollar tire?" Yeah, <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, wow. Uh, extra wants to uh, touch the nose gear wheel uh, tires, mm-hmm. nose gear tires of STS one thirty five. They cool. have them at the Kennedy Space Ooh. Center. You can just walk up and roll it around and stuff. <laughs> well. Are they are they solid? Yeah, it's like, so it's, you know, it's a normal tire. It's got air in there, but it's like, you're not going to make a difference in it. You can kind of mm. hit it and sense that it's hollow, mm. but it's a, real, <laughs> it's a real solid tire. Yeah. Well, it's probably very carefully designed. I'm, I'm yeah. just guessing. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the entire program, they only lost one tire. Wow. It was one blowout mm. uh, pretty early on, and they got spooked by it, and that's why they ended up landing at Edwards. Like, among other reasons, they ended up landing at Edwards for a few times in a row just to make mm. sure, like, you get that. <laughs> get the spare out of the trunk. Because <laughs> <laughs> at Edwards, if you run off the runway, you just keep going. It's just oh, a big, yeah. giant lake bed. Whereas at Florida, <laughs> trees. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, have have there been studies for different atmospheres? At Earth's pretty consistent, uh, but uh, I'm supposing the Moon and Mars and, mm. and potential uh, are are going to have different viscosities because of the makeup of the atmosphere, and mm. then frictions right, right. and uh, shock waves are going to have a different. Um, I mean, the shock wave uh, may have different characteristics. And- yeah, so with Mars especially, it's interesting because you obviously can't just go out and test it whenever you want. So <laughs> they do stuff like, um, you know, when Curiosity landed, they had some instrumentation on board to, you know, learn more about how the heat shield is behaving and what kind of uh, what kind of uh, conditions they are experiencing. Uh, but another thing they'll do is, I don't know if you guys heard about, what was it, the Low Density Supersonic Decelerator. Hmm. Uh, it was a program that had a couple flights now, and it's one of these programs where, like, NASA starts tweeting about it, and there's a live feed, and a lot of people start watching it, and I kind of get the feeling that, like, a lot of people walk away confused and <laughs> maybe vaguely disappointed at what happened, because hmm. it's, like, four hours of this strange-looking brown circle, and then, like, a brief rocket flight. Um, <laughs> essentially, what they did was they used a balloon to carry this small rocket and the low density supersonic accelerator up into right white high altitude and then they turn on the rocket and basically they treat the upper earth atmosphere like it's the lower martian atmosphere uh, cool. simulator hmm. yeah and so this uh just to real quick explain what it is the ldsd is it kind of uh i don't know if you've seen these in kerbal but they mm. it's like an expandable heat shield the idea is uh. you have it's almost an inflatable heat shield in a way mm-hmm. this idea is if you can have like a core heat shield and then expand it out a little bit you kind of get, you know, you get a way uh, bigger heat shield. Yeah. You don't have to carry as much stuff. So they're testing that. And it was funny because the first time they tested it, like, the parachute didn't open. Oops. And everyone's like, oh, no, that's terrible. I'm like, ah, we, you know, whatever. We got the data we want. <laughs> we'll figure out the parachute later. <laughs> but, yeah, so, I mean, Mars is tough that way. Uh, I don't know what they've done for, like, Venus. I have to imagine. Because mm-hmm. you know, that atmosphere is so thick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like the upper atmosphere of that must be, like, you know, just like the, it's like more like litho breaking than aero breaking. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The moon, of course, doesn't have any atmosphere, so that's yeah. one big challenge with that is you, you've got to spring all the fuel you can. I mean, it's got that, hello, uh, it's got that super tenuous, you know, like technically an atmosphere on there. Mm. But yeah, you got to slow yourself down the hard way on that. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah, that must be really hard on Mars. Like, you know, you have, you have models, you have expectations, but without having a lot of test data, you don't really know how it's going to go. Yeah. And like, 
you kind of see that a lot with these programs. You realize, mm-hmm. I mean, that's kind of the whole point. That's why yeah. I think, you know, not to get off on a rant or anything, but like, you know, we could talk about this later. But like mm-hmm. the whole idea of like NASA, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> NASA kind of belongs on the forefront of the stuff, kind of doing the weird stuff where there's just no data. They're the ones making that data. Mm-hmm. You know, that's kind of their roots. Back when they're still NACA, the NACA, they True. were just like making all these random airfoils and saying, here's how this wing behaved. Here's how this wing behaved. Here's how this wing behaved. And you can just look it up if you were an airplane manufacturer and get so, get a big head start. Mm. So they would just kind of be like, okay, well, we think the Martian atmosphere is like this. Now we just got to go for it. Like, is this X-15 going to hold together? And the first time you do it, maybe it didn't go so well. Maybe it goes, maybe you super over-engineered it, or maybe you didn't, and it's all burned up. And you learn from that, and you try it again. You just keep iterating, keep iterating, and you know, that's how they learn this stuff. Yeah, exactly. Well, I can think of no better way of ending this. That is fascinating. Thank you so much. This, is, this has been great. Thank, Thank you. you.